Welcome to the Clinical Athlete Journal Club number 13. My name is Quinn Hennick and I'm a proud clinical athlete provider and I'm joined as always by Kevin McNamara who's a physical therapist currently in a, the residency program at Johns Hopkins and he's a longtime clinical athlete forum member and really the one responsible for bringing this journal club to life. So thanks for being here as always, Kevin. Yeah, of course, Quinn. 2020, first journal club, we got high expectations. The first one of the year. It's been a while. It has. It has. Well, this one's, I'm excited about this one. It's the, the topic is flexibility and we've got a specific paper, but before we dig into that, we've got some poll questions just to get a feel for the room. So the first question is going to be, who are you? Are you a clinician? Are you a student clinician, coach, trainer? student coach trainer so we'll take 10 seconds or so and just uh click on the boat just to get a feel for the for the room good mix 33 percent clinician 33 percent student clinician 25 percent coach trainer oh, about 40 percent clinician and then uh got a couple student coach trainers too so good mix Got a little bit of everything. I'll show the results. Boom. Do you see the results, Kevin? Sick. Next question. Do you engage in flexibility training? Now you might ask, well, what does that mean? Well, we're gonna get into that, but just kind of as a an initial thought, yes or no. Do you engage in what you would consider to be flexibility training? There are no judgments. <laughs> It's an anonymous poll. About two thirds yes, sixty-six sixty percent yes, sixty-one percent, thirty-eight percent no. Math doesn't add up there. Weird. Okay, there we go. Fifty-seven percent yes. So maybe split. Uh, leaning towards yes in some capacity. About fifty-seven percent to forty-two percent. And then last question, do you prescribe flexibility routines or training for any of your athletes slash patients slash clients? Yes or no? Ooh. About 61% yes, 38% no, 64, 35. Okay, so leaning towards the majority, not, not a big discrepancy there, but the majority saying yes, do have some type of flexibility, something in my programming, and yes, the majority says have something like that in uh, somebody else's, you know, or, or your client's programming. And, you know, if I think about that, depending on how you define it, you know, I could I could probably go either way on that. So maybe we dig into that a little bit. And lastly, remember our journal club motto. These meetings are conducted in the sincere spirit of inquiry after truth without fondness of dispute or desire of victory. Doesn't mean we can't disagree, but it just means that we're all on the same team and we're just trying to be less wrong. So uh, we encourage the healthy, honest discussion. And uh, I'll just start digging into this, to this paper here. And also, if you don't want to verbally join in in the discussion, if you don't want to be unmuted and actually talk, you can type a question in the Q&A box and we can read it and use that as a discussion point. So you can interact and participate that way, or you can just be a fly on the wall and, and soak up the conversation. So it's totally up to you. But the title of this paper is the case for retiring flexibility as a major component of physical fitness and the author is one author it's his name is james Nuzo. and a, a couple things about this is that we actually had this author and he goes by he likes to go by jim we had jim on the clinical athlete podcast we just haven't released that discussion yet that'll probably come out in a couple weeks but we actually had him on the show to talk about this very paper. It was a good discussion. And so my thoughts are 
my thoughts, but then they're kind of rooted in also the discussion that I know that I've had with him. So I'll try to kind of share if there's any questions about the paper, you know, if I can remember the conversation, try to share some insight and, and elaboration on his end. So, so we can all kind of be on the same page of what the paper is trying to convey. And the other point about the, about this piece is that it's a, an opinion paper. So this is not a study. This paper in and of itself is not data. It's a, it's an opinion piece. It's essentially a peer reviewed blog and a review, not a systematic review, not a meta analysis. There's, uh, there's nothing like that going on here. So it is a nice review article, but just understand the limitations of a, of a paper like this. It's one author and it's his interpretation of the current evidence on the topic. So, you know, we just keep that in mind as far as a level of evidence here. But it's a great reference because it's got so many references. I mean, I'm going to be pulling this paper up to cross cross reference on this topic for for a long time. But so the title of the paper is The Case for Retiring Flexibility as a Major Component of Physical Fitness. And essentially, this paper makes a case for just that. The, the aim in section three is, and I quote, the current paper proposes flexibility be retired as a major component of physical fitness. And there's seven sections in the paper. The, it really gets into the nitty gritty in section four, where the author explains how flexibility has little or uh, no predictive or concurrent validity with, with health and performance markers or injury and pain, or uh, the data is just mixed on that. Section five is the author making a case for retiring flexibility as a major component of physical fitness. And uh, with that, if you're going to, if you're going to retire flexibility to be tested, then you're also going to make a case for decreasing the emphasis on the interventions that increase flexibility. So like static stretching. And, and so in section five, there's a case to be made for decreasing the emphasis of things like static stretching as necessary components of exercise prescription for many populations. And in section six, the author describes the implications of doing these things. So what happens if we retire flexibility as a component of physical fitness and decrease emphasis of stretching? What, what's going to happen with the patients? You know, what's gonna be the outcome of that? Um, for good or for good or bad. And then in section seven, he tries to essentially hedge his bets a little bit and, and just kind of, you know, predict some of the rebuttals and some of the counterpoints that are going to be made on the paper and just kind of hopefully fill those gaps a little bit, uh, almost like a, a kind of a preemptive Q and a, you know, to address any, any uh, shortcomings of the paper. So to dig all the way back, I thought that, Section one and section two were essentially defining terms and then going over the history, kind of a historical reference of how flexibility became a construct that we cared about in the United States. And flexibility he defines as the intrinsic properties of body tissues that determine maximal joint range of motion without causing injury. And then goes on to kind of dichotomize static flexibility and dynamic flexibility. But this paper is mostly concerned with static flexibility. So it's the joint range of motion in a relaxed muscle state. And it's usually a subjective thing. So it's the patient's tolerance to the stretch or it's the range of motion is just determined by the test, by the tester, you know, whatever their end point is. And the main outcome measure that this paper goes over to measure flexibility is the sit and reach test only because I think that that's really where the construct of flexibility was born out of. And also it's probably the test, the flexibility test that has the most research behind it. And so it's just, you know, the most cited in this particular paper, but that's just because it's got the most work done on it. So it's not, this paper is, is about flexibility as a general construct, not just the sit and reach but it just so happens that most of the research is rooted in that test. But we'll talk about flexibility maybe more as a global construct 
then we can obviously dig into the sit and reach specifically as, if that comes up in the discussion. And then section two is a historical briefing on, on flexibility. And I thought this was really good. It, it cleared up some stuff. So, you know, starting way back in the forties, uh, research on flexibility. And it seemed like to me, there wasn't a whole lot of actual experimental data that was coming out from, from 1940 to 1980 when, in 1980 when flexibility and these fitness tests really started to be kind of a mainstream thing. It was like a lot of uh, hypotheses or kind of opinion pieces, maybe some data here and there, but then extrapolating meaning from that. Um, and even a piece in 1968 that, that communicates some skepticism, some skepticism and uncertainty about flexibility and its role with human motor performance, but that kind of got pushed down. Uh, but, you know, essentially just it kind of snowballed where the, the concept of flexibility, where we compared our youth to youth of the over in Europe. And we saw that the European kids were in better shape than ours and flexibility just happened to be a test. One of the tests that they looked at and say, Oh, cardiovascular fitness, muscular strength, muscular endurance, and also were less flexible. And so they just kind of like started picking out all the things to compare to and, and flexibility was one of those things. And so it just kind of became one of the constructs that we consider to be important for physical fitness. So that was section two, just giving a historical reference, which I thought was, was good. It kind of set the tone for everything. And then in section four, I'm going to just keep doing a brief overview and then I'll throw it to Kevin and I'll throw it to the other people and we can dig into this. But section four was, talking about essentially making a case for retiring flexibility as a major component of physical fitness. And then it went on to reference all the, a lot of the literature comparing flexibility or, or showing flexibility's relationship to fall risk and uh, activities of daily living and function and gait, injury and pain, quality of life, cardiovascular outcomes, sports performance, just all these different things that, that we care about. And, you know, I took away from it is just how hard it is to try to identify risk factors and predictive factors when it comes to not just injury and pain, but performance and function and health, longevity and mortality. Because if you read through section four, it's not all studies saying that flexibility doesn't have a relationship. There's also plenty of data that says, oh, flexibility does have a relationship with gait speed, for example, or, or um, in this study, it says, oh, there's a significant relationship with injury risk in this population, but then not in this population. And, and it just a lot of equivocal data, a lot of contradictory data, and it just for me, it goes to show how hard it is to take one particular aspect and and then try to make it predictive in, in some way. And we can dig into that more. And section five was de-emphasizing, making a case for de-emphasizing stretching and exercise prescription. So if in section four, we make a case that flexibility as a standalone has a poor relationship to the outcomes that we care about, well, then we probably don't need to spend a lot of time on the interventions that affect flexibility, or we fill that time with interventions that not only double as increasing flexibility, but also provide other physiological benefits, like strength training, for example. And that was probably the, the big example was that you can get range of motion changes with strength training, you can also get strength changes with strength training. And I, I liked that section because it, it kind of uh, strung my biases a little bit. And then in section six, uh, what would happen if we reduce emphasis on flexibility and reduce emphasis on stretching? 